The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In the next few episodes, we're going to be working on the IoT on Wheels design challenge for Element 14. Yeah, we have a fella coming in to help us out, Bob Badley. He's a really great local engineer, mm. uh, electrical engineer. Basically, we're going to take the X Nucleo uh, M4 board and the uh, Bluetooth expansion board. Yes, these, together. these are the devices being featured in the design challenge. Mm -hmm. So basically, we're making a device that fits onto your bicycle and it communicates with your smartphone over Bluetooth low energy and they pass information back and forth. Mm -hmm. So like if you go over a pothole, you can hit a button and it logs it or sends an email to the city administrator saying, Dear sir or madam or whom it may concern, I've hit a pothole. Regards, Felix. <laughs> uh, yeah, and also we're going to have um, an alarm built into it and uh, vibration and tilt detection and some other things. Well, Felix, it looks like we have all the parts we need. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired designs. Imhotep's priests. Regrettable acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Okay, it's time to start the IoT on Wheels design challenge using the ST Microelectronics Nucleo 64 along with the Bluetooth module. So we have everything we need now, allegedly, right guys? Uh, we need a bicycle, because we've decided to make something with a bicycle. Oh yeah, who's gonna bring one in? Like, I brought one in one, and it's we? over there. Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> this number is giving me flashbacks the last time we did a bike project. You hold it steady for a second? Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this would be in uh, Imperial or metric. I'm trying to find the nearest mm, number. Metric. It's about 26 millimeters-ish. It's Or 1.02. You'll notice on a lot of bike parts, it's just... Oh, 26 millimeters. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I uh, didn't see the forest for the trees there. <laughs> well done, Felix. Did you want to just rebuild something about the same size? I don't see why not. You know what, why don't we just drop right into the computer? Did you, Do you need this thing? Maybe stick it over here so I can measure it. I'm just gonna draw this right into the computer and cut out the middleman. All right, so let's switch over into millimeters. Let's look at the width we have. Actually, no, let's look at the total width we have between the brakes, which is that much, but the tube actually has a little bit of compression, so let's go a little bit inside of that. It'll give us a total of, let's go 135. Center point, we'll go 135 divided by two, and then 26 divided by two is 13. And then we'll do the same thing in the other direction, 13 by 135 divided by two, <coughs> and then we can complete the square based off of that. Bam, there we go. Now I'll get rid of this, and I'm sure Fusion's gonna complain about constraints. Okay, so I'm gonna go down uh, 26 millimeters like that, and then we can fillet it. So sometimes you just kinda have to pick and choose how you say words like fillet or fillet or like Jimmy Buffett. This should, this should do it 13 millimeters. Bingo, ta-da, okay, there is our, you know, tube. Now what we can do is we've got this little guy right here in the middle. Let's just draw a keep away for that, if I can get around these cables. Uh, let's call it, uh, don't move, 46 to be safe. Okay, so we're gonna need another sketch for that, so we're gonna go on the end like that. Let's do a new sketch. I'll get rid of the body, there we go. Side sketch, let's go down 13 millimeters. That's our center point. That will match where the center of our rod is, and we'll go 46 millimeter diameter circle around that. Boom, okay, so that's our keep away point. So when we look at it from the side, See how we can see that right there? Now granted, this uh, clamp is not a cylinder, but you know, it's just we just need the rough idea of where it is so we can avoid it. Let's say 42. So what we can do here is we can take this thing and we can do a symmetrical extrusion. It'll do both sides at once. It's 42, which means we'll do 21 millimeter symmetrical extrusion. Now see how it, do, it does a subtraction there, so we'll just tell it to join instead. Cool, and actually, I think I'm gonna actually make that a new body, just in case. Okay, so it will actually be a separate thing from our original rod. So now, what we learned from this is we know where to put the uh, surface of our object, and we also know where to attach our mounting clamps right there. Assuming we do it this way, where we keep everything on the box, we'll build everything off of this platform. 
All right, getting started with the Nucleo board, we uh, go to developer.embed.org. Well, you'll need to set up an account, so I've already set up an account. You click on Compiler, and this will open up the online integrated development environment, so you can write your programs here. Currently, I've got two programs that are open already here, Blinky example and the Bluetooth uh, example. In order to get this set up, once you get into the embed software, you're gonna need to choose your hardware platform. There's a button right there in the corner. You can click on that and you can select your hardware platform. The board is the Nucleo L476RG, which is the Nucleo 64, which is the STM32L476. All three of those numbers are for the same board. So that was the first thing I did. The next thing I wanted to do was get a Blink example going. So let's go back to the developerembed.org site and say click on get started. And then here's the embed OS Blinky example, big orange button. Always look for the big orange buttons. So you click on that and then um, click on the online compiler. Then it'll open up the Blinky example in the, well actually it, it goes to this, explains what it's doing. And then you click the other orange button and it should go to the compiler. The Blinky example is finally loaded, which is awesome. So then we do compile. Now we have another progress bar. Just wait for that to go. Oh, okay, so it's compiled and gives me the option to save it. So I'm gonna save it on my local machine. I'll save right here. Now, uh, here's my file browser. In my file browser, on the left side, I have my local machine. And on the right side, I have the Nucleo that I plugged in. It shows up as a mass storage device. So I'll grab this binary file and drop it in to the Nucleo. I'll just copy it here, la -da, -da, la da da Anyway, so then that programs the uh, microcontroller there, and it's, there's the Blinky file. So now let's move on to the Bluetooth example. All right, Mr. Badley, here is the uh, example heart rate monitor program. And uh, maybe you can help me understand how this is connecting or how it's supposed to connect with the uh, other Bluetooth devices. Sure. So it looks like the program is pretty simple. The, we start with the main, and it looks like it blinks an LED every second to let us know that something is working. Cool. And we start up the Bluetooth low energy. And that does some initialization stuff. Then we've got this thing, the HRM counter. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're using the heart rate monitor service. And we start advertising and then just keep looping around and incrementing our fake heart rate. And then once it gets to 100, it drops back to 60 and starts incrementing again. So we're gonna have this really fake heart rate monitor, which will show us a number between 60 and 100 mm -hmm. and keep letting our smartphone know. All right, so um, where, where it says advertise, start advertising, where does the uh, connection actually happen? Sure, so when a Bluetooth low energy device uh, starts up, then it will advertise its presence. It's saying, hey, I'm out here. You can mm -hmm. connect to me. I'm offering services. And then you can have your smartphone connect to it. And when the smartphone connects to it, it gets a list of all of those services that are available. And those services could include like the battery mon uh, level. It could include heart rate monitor. It could include manufacturer information mm -hmm. or some other custom services. And then within each of those services, you have characteristics. So the heart rate monitor service has a defined list of characteristics like the heart rate value. Other services could have different characteristics associated with them. Those characteristics have attributes like read or write or notify. So notify means it will tell you when there is an update to the value. So for our example, what we're probably gonna do is write our own service and within that service, we'll have characteristics like button one pressed, button two pressed, and uh, shake. And then okay. we'll have to be able to have a characteristic that we write to for the alarm enabling and disabling. We will also have to send information to it for configuring the date and time. So because this is has a real-time clock that's running, we need to be able to set mm -hmm. what that time is. So we'll have to write a, a characteristic called the timestamp. So we'll do that every time it connects? Yeah. Okay. So I'm using an app for iOS called LightBlue by a company called Punchthrough, and it should show any of the peripherals that are nearby. So this app basically shows you what's on the Bluetooth device, so you can basically sniff it out and then learn everything about it to write your own custom apps with? Exactly, this is a great app for developing and seeing what's going on so underneath. So it's kind of like almost like a terminal emulator for Bluetooth. It pretty much is, yeah. That's cool. cool. And there's a, is there an Android version of this? I don't know. I'll just refresh and we'll see that our device pops right up. There it is. So I connect to it, 
And these are the services and characteristics that are available. So if we open up the heart rate measurement and turn on listen for notifications, you can see that oh, every cool. second it's incrementing with the next value. Is so this is our fake smaller number value. the time code? Uh, yes. This is with notifications on, which allows us to keep receiving data. Other possibilities are to read, or there are some, like the heart rate control point characteristic, allows us to write. Oh, so we'll have neat. When we make our own service for this particular application, we'll make I a bunch on. of different characteristics that we can read and write from. So there you go. Oh, okay. So as soon as you hit done, it writes it. Yep. Neato. So on this other one, this is the same measurement. We're just seeing it change over time as it goes up here. Yeah. So based on the code that we were just looking at, mm -hmm. it starts at 60 and increments up to 100 and then starts over, starts over at 60 again. And that's 60 in decimal, and this is currently showing in hex. Got it. So we have a proof that we can communicate from the Bluetooth module to our iPad. Could we change the code as such that when we go to this um, write, uh, you know, the thing where we can write something, what if we try writing that value into the counter and then see if we can see the change on the iPad? We absolutely could. Is that something you could work on, Felix? Yeah. Cool. Let's take a look at the code and figure out how to do it. So we need to create a callback when data is written. So that's what this line does. So I'm going to copy that and paste it in right there. And when stuff happens, this on data written callback, we need to copy that and create something similar. So I did the same thing, just cut, or took out that statement. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that's all we need to do to process to change the value written. So we just compile and now we can drag it over and that should kill my connection. Bloop, 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 bloop. It's there again. Mm -hmm. So heart rate measurement, we'll just listen for notifications and we can see it's incrementing there. It started at 40 hex. Yeah. So let's write 40 and see what happens. Yes. Cool. All oh, right, you did it. it bravo, worked. bravo, bravo. Mm, mm, mm. Well done. So, cool. So we have a complete loop of communication. Yeah. We awesome. can just keep resetting it down to, and it keeps resetting. That's pretty much everything we need. Okay, well, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Project over. Now that we have a basic idea of how the hardware is going to work, I'm going to continue working on the mounting system. So this drawing here represents the bike, like the handlebars and the, the clamp in between. So I'm going to draw some things on top of it. I have a sketch here. I call it case base. So this is what the rider would see. So the circuit board is going to go here and then on the side we'll have the buttons. These circles represent the pivot points of the thumbs. So I can draw circles from those pivot points to figure out the best place to put the buttons. So what I did first was I started drawing a couple clasps like that. So what we have is we have a uh, kind of a question mark shape that doesn't move and this will be clamped to the main body uh, represented by that. And then we have a moving part here that goes into it. So we'll put a screw in here to give it a pivot point. And then at the bottom, we'll have another screw which will actually clamp it together. So one thing I did here, this circle or this center hole is 26 millimeters, which is exactly the uh, diameter of the tube, but we have to assume uh, slop and other deviations. So I drew a polygon inside of it to reduce the actual number of points that contact with the pipe. Because if there's too many points, it's not going to be accurate enough and it's not going to fit. But by reducing the number of contact points, it gives us a little bit more play. Except for on the compression part here, that I want to actually squeeze tightly so that I, I have that as a curve. So I made these as separate parts. See yeah, how they have mounting screw points there? And I also made a mirror of it and they'll fit together like that. So I'm going to 3D print these up and make sure they fit on the bike handle. And then I can continue building the base up from here.
Now let's see if it fits. I don't think I'd worry about this falling off accidentally. Oh no, I fit a major pothole. You think you'd drop off a cliff and probably stay on? <laughs> there we go. Oh wow, you almost don't even need the screws. I think what I'll probably do is, um, obviously we need this to have screw holes and mounting points for the buttons, but I know where the buttons are gonna go. And of course, we'll have the hole here for the um, piezo to stick out the bottom. But uh, yeah, it looks like the clamping method is gonna work. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna continue, you know, refining the design and then making sure everything fits. And uh, yeah, but uh, this part looks good. Well, Ben, I've put some time in trying to decipher this I squared C library. Mm -hmm. Apparently, it's not as straightforward as I anticipated. Yeah, usually they're pretty simple. Um, what was the problem you came across? I'm not sure if it's writing correctly or if it's reading correctly. Oh, well, we wrote that string to it using that sample program, and then we were reading the first character. Mm. So the I squared C library is something we need to work on. Mm -hmm. I cool. also need to figure out once. Well, I, I guess well, after getting the I squared C library figured out, how we're going to write the logs to the EEPROM? Yeah, I still don't quite understand what that's all about. That was something you and uh, Bob were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. okay. In case the uh, unit isn't connected to a phone, it can still log data with a real-time clock and have date and time stamps on them. We have that extra board, don't we? Yeah. Maybe what we could do is um, I could take one of the boards and hook a I squared C EEPROM up to that so we could both work on the problem okay. at the same time yeah. and then maybe have a chance of coming to a conclusion faster. Mm -hmm. Cool. But it seems like we've gotten quite a bit done. Uh, you know, Bob is really good at writing apps and that Bluetooth stuff he knew all about, so that yeah. was a big help. And uh, I have the, uh, you know, the case idea about half done. I got the clamps working. We got the rumble motor integrated. I have a pretty good idea of where we're going to put the piezo. And we made the start, started building the expansion board. So yeah, it seems pretty good so far. So that's all the time we have for today. We've uh, familiarized ourselves with the embed platform and we've figured out inputs, outputs, figured out how to get the Bluetooth communicating with the phone, and then you've uh, pretty much got most of the case design. Yep, yep, this is actually our first time working with the ST microelectronics device, but so far it's been pretty smooth. In the next episode, we're going to continue working on the app, Bob's gonna do that. In the meantime, Felix is gonna work on the embedded code using embed, and I'll get the rest of the electronics wired up and designed into a single enclosure case with some nice big rubbery buttons that we can clamp onto a bike so you can report those potholes. Cool. We'll see you next time. It completes the code. Uh, you want me to do another take of that? No, that was fine. I thought y'all were spared no expense on your voice actors. This is merely a rough, fully completed animation. <laughs> what the fart mode? This is my loading um, icon, or whatever that is, whatever. That's me trying to be funny. <sighs> Stay. It's time again for the portable N64! Unfortunately, we haven't given up on it. Ah, the Nintendo 64 caused me to smoke! Oh, so, it maybe feels like the end is in sight. This system mostly makes me mad. Eh, 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 eh.